punch in on the art. Hi, thank you all for coming. I think I might know everyone in the room, which is really exciting because I know that no one will hold back from asking questions or telling me what you're interested in or sharing responses to artwork. So I think we could really have a lot of fun with being able to talk about the works in the show and especially for those of you in our, our docent program who are talking about this show to the community or to children, um, to the kinds of questions and conversations that you want to inspire about the work. Um, it would be great to hear. But um, just to be formal, uh, my name is Danielle Knapp. I'm the Makash Associate Curator at the JSMA and the co-curator of this exhibition, Scrimmage Football and American Art from the Civil War to the Present, which will be on view through December 31st and then we'll travel to two more venues. So we organized the show with Colorado State University's Art Museum, which has since been reopened in an amazing new building and renamed the Gregory Alucar Museum of Art. Uh, and then it will travel on to, so they had the show at their venue for their football season last year. And then it will travel on to the Figgy Art Museum in Davenport, Iowa, and then the Canton Museum of Art in Ohio after us. So it'll move beyond academic art museum communities um, into different communities. So Scrimmage came about um, as, and actually because our, our co-curator excuse me, co-curator for the show is named Linny Frickman. She's the director and curator at the Colorado State University Art Museum. Sometimes when you hear me talk about we, she's the we I'm talking about, my, my collaborative partner in this project, um, who will actually be here in October to give a lecture called Gendered Games, talking about the intersections of gender and art and sport, and talking about her experience working on the show. So that's on October 22nd. Um, but Linny and I, for the past several years before the show opened, we were talking about a shared interest in what images of football could say about American culture, how they document things in our culture, how they perpetuate certain ideas that we have, and how the visual language of sport really shapes public perception. Uh, people don't even realize if they're fans of the sport or if they're not fans of the sport, how much artists have influenced the way that we think about the sport visually, the way that we understand and consume the sport. And so one of our goals for this project was to bring together all of these artworks by major American artists. In most cases, the artists depict whose work are here these aren't artists who were football artists. They weren't artists for whom this was the bulk of their output or who um, are known maybe for their football imagery, but it happened frequently enough during their career that they chose to depict the sport um, for whatever reasons that may have been, commissioned for a magazine, their own personal interest, and in some cases, in many cases actually, um, many of the artists depict, whose work is here or depict football and it's a sport they knew personally because they might have played in high school or college, in some cases at a professional level. So we wanted to bring all these images together because they, we thought looking at this and studying it as the visual record of the way that a phenomenon in American culture has developed and continues to persist might tell us interesting things about, um, as part of our larger theme for our exhibitions this year, the idea of American identity and, and how do we think about that and what does it mean to be an American and how can we look at um, aspects of American culture um, to, to sort of self-reflect and think about why do we think or feel the way we do about certain things. So let's come around the side of the wall here and I'll point out a few works that are good starting points. So long before football was immediately available and live streamed on TV or on the internet or before people could click a button and rewatch something um, or have access to images in, you know, in real time of the sport, the way that Americans were understanding football was through magazines and what was printed and what they um, could touch and feel. So uh, I wanted to talk about the work of Frederick Remington, who, you know, the name Remington you may think of, and, and rightfully so, think of military imagery, think of the American West, um, but he spent a great deal of time depicting football, and it's a sport that he knew personally. He had played football at Yale. Yale University is often the subject of his football images in this show, including these pieces here, and then a, a series of works on paper that we'll look at at the other side of the gallery. And there's a story about Remington before one of his games stopping at a slaughterhouse on the way to his game to get some blood on his uniform. So he would show up, in his words, looking more businesslike because he wanted to be an intimidating, serious force. And so um, he was hired by, in this case, um, this is the reproduction that appeared in Harper's Weekly. Let's see, a, the year that he painted this image of a, a scene between Princeton and Yale football match. Um, he was hired to depict the sport, and it was actually one of our challenges early on in organizing this exhibition for Linny and I. We, we thought our focus was going to be to track down the original works of art. So in the cases of 
works that were published in popular media, we thought, well, let's see how many of those paintings we can find, because the works on paper are taken from the painting. Um, so as art historians, that's where our focus initially was. And we learned pretty quickly, one, that's hard to find uh, many of the paintings that were used for Harper's Weekly or other periodicals you'll see on view here. In some cases, that they weren't preserved, because this is what the magazine that were hiring the artists to make these images wanted, was what they were going to reproduce and share with the wide public. Um, and sometimes, you know, if they didn't make it in a museum collection or if they weren't featured in a catalog from a previous exhibition, they kind of got lost in history. We tried to track down works by Edward Penfield and J.C. Leyendecker, some of the major illustrators whose covers of uh, magazines we'll talk about when we get to the other side of the gallery. And we just kept hitting dead ends and we realized, you know, th there's a reason why these are what persist because this is sort of the important element. This is the way the visual images were really being consumed by a large population. Um, and it's interesting to note, too, that Frederick Remington, he titled his work this long, very specific title that gives the score of the game, the day it was played on. Um, and when the magazine reproduced it, they titled it A Collision at the Ropes. So they were giving it already a more dramatic, more descriptive title. Um, the two works on paper that are on the wall opposite me are by Winslow Homer, and they're the earliest works in the exhibition. So 1857, um, 1865, both of these printed before the first collegiate game was even played in 1869. And they're an interesting comparison between the two. And Winslow Homer was one of many artists who was very concerned about having his works uh, reproduced as accurately as possible in magazines. And so whereas every publication would have a staff engraver, staff printmaker who would be, you know, very faithfully reproduce works like Remington's painting into a print. Uh, Winslow Homer and later Remington, they didn't trust anyone to do what they wanted to do themselves. And they were talented printmakers so they could handle this. So Homer actually did his own engravings to be used on, on the paper for widespread distribution. Um, but here in the 1857 image, it's titled The Match Between Softs and Freshmen, the opening. This is a depiction of the first week of the term at an Ivy League college in the late 1850s, and you see the young incoming freshmen who look too young to even be in college. It's amazing to see, you know, just by the scale how small <laughs> some of them are compared to the older manly sophomores who are wearing top hats and have these really masculine mustaches, and they're about to play a game of football as an initiation game. And it looks very proper, especially with the stance, but this was known as Bloody Monday because it was such a physical, brutal game. There were no rules, there were no officials. This is before there was any sort of collegiate oversight of the sport at any level. So it really resembled more a brawl based on sort of rugby and other early games where the whole point was to, to injure your op opponent. Um, and this, when you think about the time this was happening, so 1865, we're looking at soldiers playing. It's at the end of the Civil War. And then football really developed as a collegiate sport in the next several years after that time. And um, as opposed to baseball, which at this time was already established as the American pastime, it was being played at all levels, all ages, um, across the country. Football really developed within this very elite um, upper class white Ivy League community. Um, but it was really led by students who wanted to play and then it kind of came about that rules had to be enforced and a structure had to be, um, be enforced because schools wanted to play against one another. Um, but in the late 1860s and going into the 1870s and 1880s and 90s, after the Civil War, after um, sort of at that time a lot of people were thinking, you know, we've conquered the frontier, we've, we've won the Civil War. Um, maybe somebody's older brother or father had been a war hero and their name was attached with great glory on the battlefield. So what did a young man from a well-to-do family do at a time when there wasn't a war that you could go to to prove your mettle? You would fight on the battlefield of football and part of the point of um, players playing the sport at that time was to prove themselves. They had a name, they had a, a masculinity to uphold. Uh, as we put together the exhibition and as we walk through and talk about a lot of these images, this theme of masculinity and the construction of American ideas of masculinity continues to come up. And in many ways, football has reinforced that. And in many more ways, the visual record of the sport has sometimes enforced, reinforced and sometimes challenged that. So if we walk a little further down the gallery, um, because we did not arrange the show chronologically, I'll be jumping forward and backwards in time a little bit, so my apologies for, for that. But I'm not going to go over in detail the eight sections that the works are organized in because we have descriptions throughout the gallery and I think that that's separate from what I'm able to talk about in person. So uh, I'm going to sort of ping pong around a bit. But I did want to point out that we have photographs throughout the show um, and later on, when we're on the other side of the gallery, we'll talk more about the role of photography and sports culture. 
Um, but I wanted to mention the work of Todd Papa George, who was, is an amazing photographer, documentary and street photographer. He and two other photographers on view in this gallery were all working in the 60s and 70s. And all through one body of work or another chose to depict sports, not just football, but in all three cases, many images of football. And there were a few other great documentary photographers from this time period that we would have liked to have included and for reasons weren't able to borrow the works at that time. Uh, but Tom Papa George, three of his images from a series called American Sports 1970 or How We Spent the War in Vietnam appear here. And they were published in a book um, after he did the project. It was funded by a Guggenheim grant. And it's amazing to look through at his photographs and see where he went to college football games, horse races, professional baseball games, uh, car races, a whole different series of athletic events and turned his lens to spectators. So one of the things we were interested in with this show too for Lenny and myself being women and art historians who had never played football and didn't know the sport from, from the inside. Um, but admittedly both had been longtime fans, so we had always known football from the role of the fan or the observer or the spectator, the consumer. And so we were really interested, once we started paying attention to how many artists have also been interested in what's the experience of the spectator, um, how quickly images that depict the crowds or people who are working at the events um, or the fans' activities um, and further down the line tailgate activities and this whole public culture beyond what happens during you know, four quarters of gameplay. And we thought that's a whole other sort of description of American life. And Todd Papa George, that's why he was interested in doing that when he did this pho pho photography series. He thought, you know, he was taught in his Guggenheim application, he said he wanted to document the violently disturbed American spirit. So he was interested in post Kent State, I mean, the same year Kent State had happened, um, men were at war in Vietnam, it was a very, um, you know, tense political and cultural climate. He was interested in how are Americans responding to this, coping with it, escaping from it, and he thought sports uh, activities were an important part to document um, for the various reasons why people were attending at that time. But let's go um, to this corner here, and we'll jump forward a little bit in time from what we were talking about with the periodicals on view there. Because another thing that came out through our research and as we compiled the checklist for this show was um, how prominently it was emphasized throughout the words of politicians, especially in the case of Theodore Roosevelt, who I'll talk about um, the way that he talked about football and manhood uh, in, at the turn of the century in 1900, but also up to the present day. The sort of ways that we talk about the sport, the way that the sport has been militarized to an extent, the sort of um, patriotism and the military language used in the sport, when you talk about a blitz in football, once you start looking for terms or references to the American military um, in football specifically, you find again and again so many correlations and they didn't happen by accident. So Theodore Roosevelt had given a talk, um, I think in Chicago in 1899 or 1900, where he had likened football to the way that a, a man should live his life. So an emphasis on physical fitness and hitting the line hard and teamwork and all these sort of um, ideal virtues for the perfect man who met all these criteria of being a strong, able-bodied American. Uh, in 1900, too, we continue to have this increased sort of threat to masculinity because now we've talked about how young men were responding to sort of a post-war environment that they were, they were in, but what was also happening in the early 20th century with industrialization and machinery was Re Roosevelt and others were concerned about once you take away these these tasks that able-bodied men used to do and you uh, have machinery doing tasks, that was another concern about how might we be able to show that we're you know, strong and how do we keep our populace able-bodied. So he was really um, encouraging a shift towards organized sports and especially football as ways to sort of reinforce those ideals within American culture. And he called this the strenuous life. And we'll see throughout um, imagery, especially on this wall too, these references to war as a struggle, uh, excuse me, football as a struggle or war, um, connections between war imagery. Um, and the way that football was being used um, in schools with young men being, it was, you know, at this point it had been being played in colleges for many years now, and so there were leagues, or there were teams in the college that were playing. But this is an image from 1935 um, by Lewis Wicks Hines, and I point it out here because when we get down the gallery a little further and I talk about the work of a contemporary photographer, Catherine Opie, I want to reference um, the way that Lewis Hines was an influence to her body of work. And so, um, 
when you have more time to go through the gallery, there are some of these pieces. If you get you know, close enough to safely read some of the, the descriptions of the work, you can see these very over, um, obvious references to how football was seen as sort of um, a continuation of the gladiator tradition or, or successful war efforts. So we can go down this way a little more. This George Bellows drawing. Bellows was um, an athlete, although he hadn't played football. He's known for um, his image. He hadn't played football much. He actually tried out for his Ohio State team as a freshman. He didn't make the team, and it crushed him. But he's known for his imagery of several other American sports. And his image here, as well as Norman Rockwell, and a lot of the other depictions on this wall um, are further reinforce the idea of as football as the American sport and how we start to see certain archetypes associated with the sport develop in the visual language. So the quarterback is hero. And um, in Norman Rockwell's drawing, which was actually for an ad in a magazine um, in 1961, this does not, this is the original drawing, so it doesn't include the text from the magazine, but the text itself likened, you know, it says, the title is, A Little Kid Has Lots of Heroes. And you see this little boy following, you know, an older friend or his brother who's dressed up in a football uniform. He's carrying the bucket and he's, you know, helping him out. But the language that accompanied it talked about, um, you know, the, the heroes of the halfback, the cop on the corner, or even dear old dad. So setting up these correlations between who are the heroes in the society and what is the imagery that Americans would immediately recognizable as being strong and being uh, virtuous. At the same time, too, we see throughout the early 20th century, um, once the shift from sort of the black and white reproductions in periodicals depicting football, um, that was a, a very important part of developing football culture at the time, but more so it paved the way for magazine covers. So we have covers from the Saturday Evening Post, Collier's, all these other periodicals that were widely distributed that regularly featured football on the cover. And Lion Decker is one of a handful of illustrators who was really well known for her depictions of several things beyond football. Lion Decker, if you don't know his name, you definitely know his imagery because he's someone who depicted a certain depiction of Santa Claus that became ingrained in American psyche. Um, he was, I think, the first illustrator who associated the New Year's baby, so the image of the fat, happy little baby on New Year's, you know, representing the new year. That was his doing, um, baskets of flowers on Mother's Day. And especially, even though we'd already seen that there had there've already been a history of playing Thanksgiving weekend football games in um, the universities by this time. He further reinforced it in these correlations that he drew between you know, the American football hero, where you can see this overly masculine figure whose uniform is ripped open, standing with um, this idealized pilgrim with this fancy gun and all of his armor. So making this very um, strong <laughs> connection between these are you know, the pioneers, the pilgrims, the heroes of, of our time. Um, centuries later. So we jump ahead in time and we can look at the work of Catherine Opie and what informed this particular um, body of her work that she just completed about uh, five years, actually by now it's been more than five years ago, almost ten years ago. These images, uh, she's a, a California-based photographer who's done series of landscapes and portraits and she's really interested in looking at marginalized groups and societies and giving them an opportunity to um, you know, reveal themselves in an authentic way. And you might think, well, what's, you know, what's marginalized about football? That's the most American, most idealized thing. Um, but she had grown up not really being a part of any football culture. And you can come a little closer, too, if you'd like, so we can see. I know you don't want to block the camera, but... Um, so she really didn't know a lot about football and hadn't paid a lot of attention to it at the time when she started this project. Uh, but her partner had grown up in small town Louisiana and when she'd travel back to Louisiana with her partner, she noticed pretty quickly that all of her partner's family, all the young boys between certain ages, were um, obsessed with football and talking about the teams they were on. And when the, team, when the family would go to one of the games in their small town, it was like the whole community came out and it became, for that couple of hours, its own community within itself, existing for this one sole purpose. Um, and she was really fascinated by that. And so she began a project that took her over the course of a year to several different states, um, among them Texas and Hawaii and Louisiana, but, that's, but she went throughout California and I think to Alaska and a few other places. And she did two things when she was there. Um, as I had mentioned, Lewis Hine and his documentary photographs were really influential to her own for photography practice even before she had moved on to this project. Um, but she was aware that, she, that he had photographed football players at a high school. 
but she was interested in capturing um, young men who are at this point where their lives are, you know, everything's spread out before them. So they're high school football players. We know that very few, if any, might go on to play at a college level, and from that, very few, if any, might have any chance of playing beyond college. Um, so she was interested in documenting them at this point in their life, and right now, you know, in 2007, We've all, just in a little bit of time we've walked through here, we've established there have been decades, over 100 years of this development of certain ideas about what does it mean to be the quarterback, what associations do you have with the idea, you know, the, the terms being benched. Um, how do people inform their own personal sense of identity when there are such prominent, uh, very strongly held ideas about all the different aspects of this, the team they're on, the role they play on the team. And so she did two things. She observed the teams at practices. So the men that are photographed here, and these two are just two of, she took you know, over hundreds of photographs at the time, so there are many more images that are available um, to look at online on her gallery website if you're interested in the full body of work. Uh, she photographed them at the end of their practices. So in their practice gear, they've just been playing for one to two hours. At the end of the day, they're tired, they've been working hard. And she would just pull them aside one by one and ask them to reflect on their proudest moment. She didn't give them much more parameters than that, so she was just sort of giving them this prompt to send their mind into thinking something that was um, self-reflective, but not saying specifically at this practice or within football or anything like that. Uh, and then she'd photograph them, and sometimes you see them sort of stone-faced, sometimes you see them um, in the larger body of work with sort of bravado in their, in their stance. Um, but she also then would attend one of their games and she would photograph the team during the game, but wasn't interested in capturing sort of the heroic moments that all of the, she calls, you know, the real sports photographers who were along the sidelines with her, what they wanted. She wasn't interested in the touchdown or the nail-biting finish or fumble recovery. She was interested in what happens during the rest of the time because so few of those heroic moments actually occur during the course of a game and everything else is the in-between. And she wanted to photograph that in-between space um, because it really did resonate with the way she was thinking about that in-between space of the students who are athletes at these high school teams. And so you'll see in the series of what she calls her high school football landscapes, um, it's hard to tell what's going on. I mean, maybe you don't, you know, it's obvious there's nothing really, uh, no critical moment in the game is occurring. Um, but she had been interested when she attended the games at that Louisiana field the years earlier when she conceived of this project and how not only did people come together to create this community, but the spectacle of it. She said, I just loved all of it. I loved the lighting. I loved that it was like a stage for these players. And it's very similar in the way that the video artist, William Wiley, whose work is on view here, play, it's a 15-minute video called Prairie that plays on rotation. Um, he speaks in a very similar way about his interest. And this is another high school football team. He recorded them during their first week of practice in rural Colorado. And then he edited together snippets of what he had recorded, but he didn't um, interrupt their practice at all. He used a single handheld camera. And so he also was interested in how do players interact with their landscape. What, is the, what does that sort of experience provide for someone who's viewing it? So you, you can hear you know, the coaches whistle, you can hear them counting off during drills. Sometimes you see a lone truck go past. Uh, but other than that, you're just this, this observer in this process that unlike the games where they have tens of thousands, a hundred thousands, if you extend it to TV, hundreds upon hundreds of thousands um, spectators, a practice like this that makes up the bulk of the football experience um, usually doesn't have anybody watching. And we have a couple of current Ducks football players who walked through the exhibition with me before, as it was being installed, and chose works to respond to for our Guide by Cell program. Um, two of the players walking through separate from one another both focused in on this piece and, and just got completely entranced watching it. And it was amazing because I asked one of them, uh, or he was talking about how, you know, I went to a small school like that. I played on a six on six or eight on 18 because we didn't have enough players to play, you know, a full team together. Um, so this directly speaks, this looks like it could have been my, my hometown a few years ago. Uh, and then the other player, when he came through, I asked, I thought, oh, you know, maybe he's reflecting the same way. So what kind of high school did you go to? He said, big high school in a city, so many kids, completely different than the first student. But he had the same reaction to this because the drills, and the, you know, the, all those things, the building blocks of the sport, everything that leads up to the showmanship and the spectacle of, the, of a game itself are the same anywhere. So it was amazing to see how this respond, you know, they both responded to it in that way. And William Wiley also did a series of photographs of the team um, that we didn't have on view for this exhibition, but he documented them in that way as well.
We have two sections on this side of the gallery that address um, gender in sports and the issue of celebrity and sort of the media propagation of the sport. Um, and a lot of those topics intertwine with one another. I did want to point out that the works on this wall by Robert Rauschenberg, who we know of five other football-related images that he created. So if you, don't, if you didn't think of Robert Rauschenberg immediately when you heard football art, now you will. And Wayne Thiebaud, who you might know better for his paintings of cakes and pies and his great color and pop art, um, had actually been a football player himself in high school and he broke his back and then had to take a break from football to recover and that's when he started creating art as a young man. Um, but I point these out because they're from the same year, 1963, and although some of the artists in the gallery behind this wall that we'll talk about maybe more directly address the idea of celebrity and media's impact on the sport of football and our perception of football, um, both of these men also were thinking about that, especially in the issue of football players becoming larger than life. So we've been seeing um, in print journalism and the reproductions in, on paper of football games and the kind of language and imagery used to talk about it. But now that we're getting into the 60s and 70s, we have ESPN, we have televised Super Bowls. It's becoming something where um, not only are fans who are interested in football, watching football, um, not only are they taking a notice of this change, but so are people who realize that, gosh, football is very well suited for American television and commercial breaks. And they have this convenient halftime in the middle where we can do a show or have commercials. This is a 15-minute break, something that baseball doesn't provide or other sports that had been you know, being televised at the same time didn't provide. So football was kind of at this perfect time very ready to be visually consumed in this new media and adapted very quickly to television coverage. Um, some of the artists that directly respond to that in this gallery include Red Grooms, who's larger than life, blow up of uh, Fran Tarkenton, you know, one of the superstars of the Minnesota Vikings, and in the 70s, he was the first athlete to host Saturday Night Live. And so we might now, um, or I might now, you know, take for granted the fact that a lot of times athletes and celebrity, those lines are so, um, you know, that's so intermingled that you might know as much about an athlete's personal life or legal troubles or any other things going on um, than you would know about their stats on the field. But up until the 70s, people didn't have quite as much access to uh, athletes' life, um, to their personal lives. And so for, um, Red Grooms, who also did the prints on view here where he's depicting an artist friend who's watching the Super Bowl and enjoying a beer and relaxing, um, was interested in the celebrity, the nature of celebrity, and this is, you know, purposefully referencing like a big float in a Thanksgiving parade or a balloon, like something fun and frivolous. But he also painted it on the underside of the vinyl, the way that medieval glass painters would paint back, you know, backwards, layering backwards in the color. So he was directly referencing and acknowledging these other art, art historical traditions. Uh, similarly, the work of Mark Newport, who's a Contemporary artist, teaches at the Cranbrook Academy of Arts. Um, does, he does a lot of work reflecting on his own notions of masculinity and collectability. So here we have several collectible football cards that he has, there many from his personal collection, that he has put beads on. So you'll, if you look up close without you know, bumping your head, <laughs> um, you can see that he's sort of bedazzled all the players' numbers, decorated them, you know, purposefully choosing beads because it references like evening wear, traditionally feminine um, materials, but also the f traditionally considered feminine craft of needlepoint or beadwork. He had read Rosie Greer's Needlepoint for Men. So Rosie Greer was a football player who published a book on needlepoint. He started doing that um, as a joke and then became, you know, really, he became committed to it and said, people need to know that this is a, a valid use of their time. And so uh, Mark Newport had had that book. So he was interested in that tension between why do we decide what's masculine or what's feminine and what happens when you sort of confront, confront that in a physical object, but also playing with the idea of collectability. So for people who are interested in sports memorabilia or football cards, they aren't going to want ones that a, an artist has come along and glued beads to or poked holes in. That's going to be the last thing that they're interested in. So by him doing that purposefully to these objects, has he ruined them? Has he elevated them? It really depends on who's thinking about them and in what way and in what context. In a museum, we think, oh, this is elevated to fine art. Um, this is worthy of being protected in a vitrine. You know, a major artist made this. But if somebody were, someone who has spent years collecting football cards, this isn't going to be the object that they want. And he likes, you know, that kind of, ah, what have you done? <laughs> One of the challenges we had in curating the show also was in the way that we wanted to present images of women. So 
Um, it really was challenging to try to find images that departed from what we were easily able to find a lot of women as cheerleaders or drum majorettes, as consumers, spectators. Um, we know in contemporary, in our contemporary time, women are major football fans and spend as much money supporting football um, as men, but the history, the, the visual history does not, sh it's, it was difficult for us to find um, many images to bring together. Doesn't mean that they don't exist, but as is the case with other images we try to track down this show, for this show, like early representations of African American players or um, early images actually of players of any ethnicity in the first several decades of the sports history, even though other teams and different communities started up, especially at the historically black colleges and universities, um, the visual record just doesn't exist in the same way it does for schools like Harvard and Yale that had a, you know, a different student body. Um, in some part, I think sometimes those materials, if they were ephemera, like football programs, they weren't meant to last. They weren't meant to be recorded. So unless an archivist or someone who was a collector held on to them and preserved them, many times those objects, even though they would have existed at the time, just didn't make it into collections that, that we were easily able to identify. But our search continues, so we haven't given up. Um, but Charles Dana Gibson did this great image that was reproduced in Life in 1895. And I should mention, too, as you go through the gallery on your own, you'll see um, at least four or five different artists whose illustrations appeared before 1900. So this is how early the sports visual culture was being disseminated. Um, but in this image, it's called the coming game, game, Yale versus Vassar. You have a male Yale player carrying the ball who's being run down by a, a group of, um, it's an imagined game, so this is not based on a historical event. Uh, but Vassar, a women's college, was known for its students being, along with being incredibly intelligent, well-educated, um, also being physically fit. They had a great athletics program there. And so it was common knowledge, the public perception of a Vassar woman was that she was strong athletically. So Charles Dana Gibson has you know, put that thought to the test by showing them in a game where they look like they have the upper hand as they're running down this ball carrier who looks, you know, he looks kind of frightened of them and she looks very determined. This one's paused to pull her hair back, like getting serious about it. it made me think of, you know, the Remington um, uniform anecdote. Um, you can see people being trampled underneath here. But at the time, too, in 1895, this is quite a controversial image, too. So for those in American culture who might have been concerned about perceived threats to masculinity, having a magazine depict an image of women running down uh, a male football player you know, probably ruffled some feathers. So let's go around the corner to finish with a few other objects, and then um, we'll have time for discussion or questions. So I mentioned earlier about the role of photography and how that intersects with sports. And I wanted to point out, too, that although most of the individuals whose work is on view here, um, and I should also have mentioned that despite it being difficult to find many images of women in different roles within sort of the genre of football, um, there are plenty of female artists who have depicted the sport over the years. And so um, some of the names you'll see on labels throughout are of female artists. Um, but Harold Egerton was one person who did not come into, he didn't create this image because of his fine arts background. He was an electrical engineer. He was the man who realized that, wow, machinery seems to stop if you shine a strobe light on it. It looks momentarily like it stops in time. And he used that observation to develop flash photography. And so because he wanted to test out flash photography and see how clear an image he could get of something that was an incredible quick motion, of course, he looked at sports action for that. And you'll see also um, works by another, art, another photographer um, that has the same thought of, if we can slow down and capture all these moments in a complicated action, like the quick kick of a ball, um, you know, that's really going to move photography forward and move our understanding of how the human body works forward. So both of these fields were um, helping one another. But here you can see, if you look up close, you'll actually even see the little wire that the foot of the kicker triggers as he kicks the ball, which would have activated the flash to go off so that he could get this photograph where you know, the first quarter of the football has already been kicked in by the shoe because the photograph took so quickly. This was revolutionary. And then in our final section of the gallery, um, I actually like to talk about the themes of athleticism and sort of the inherent violence of a full contact sport like football as sort of two sides of the same coin because on the one hand you do have the amazing physical prowess of, of athletes who have dedicated hours, years of their life to um, practicing a sport but with that comes the brutality of, of injuries that do happen and we think about the concussion crisis as being a contemporary concern or something that 
Um, you know, people played football and ran at each other like brutes, like what we did, saw in our early, you know, when we looked at works on the other side of the gallery. But even that early, players and physicians were, were taking note of the fact that people were putting their bodies and brains at risk in the sport, and they were trying to um, make some changes to at least lessen the impact. Um, football, we passed through the section without being able to stop to talk about the history of football in um, the reservation schools or at Carlisle. We can talk about that more in discussion too. But even there, you know, the, the school administrators who had been using football initially as a means of forced assimilation for Native American youth at boarding schools, when they realized, oh, people are getting hurt over this and it looks really terrible, it looks really violent. When people are watching students play this game, it's really upsetting. Um, they actually tried to then remove it from the program, but at that point students said, well, no, we want to play. Um, but so you'll see at Yale in these depictions also by Remington, some early attempts at um, nose and mouth guards. These were actual products that were for sale. Um, so this is something that players would actually buy to try to protect their face. Um, cartoonists at the time would sometimes depict football players with long floppy hair because people um, recognize that um, as identifying someone as a football player because football players were growing out their hair as a means of trying to add a little padding to their head. They were actually doing this. Um, and so it became you know, overemphasized in caricatures of the sport. And then at some point, officials were then required on the field and later helmets were required. But it was a slow but steady progress towards trying to make corrections to the way the sport is played without sacrificing what people loved about playing the sport. Um, the images on this wall, the first five here by Frederick Remington are called a day at the Yale team, so they do depict some of the physical brutality of the sport. Um, W.A. Rogers' image called Out of the Game shows a player down on the field, and the you know, game plays continuing on a few feet behind him. Um, and I like to point out with this sculpture by um, a professor who taught um, at the, I always forget which university it was, University of Pennsylvania. He was teaching human anatomy, and he was also a very talented sculptor. And so he continued to develop his sculpture skills because he wanted to create his own models to use for his classes. He wasn't satisfied with what, with what was available. And so this is a wedge play that he repeatedly had the, the college team reenact so that he could keep looking at it from all different angles to study it because he wanted to depict what was happening. Um, and if you walk around to the reverse side, you'll see that there's a player trampled underfoot um, behind the heroic action that's happening this way. And this play eventually got, out, uh, got banned from the sport because it was so dangerous. Um, there's a video work by Sean Leonardo, contemporary artist. Um, you're, you're welcome to use the headphones and listen to um, the sound that accompanies it. And earlier, we were talking about drills like one-on-ones. The drill depicted here is called Bull in the Ring. It's banned at some levels because it's dangerous. Um, but Sean Leonardo did this same drill when he himself was a college football player. So he experienced firsthand um, a drill where one person is chosen. In this case, if you're watching the video, he's the figure in black. Um, so that's the artist and the one who's putting his body at risk. Um, and all the other players circle around and run at the one in the middle, one, one by one. So bull in the ring. It's like recreating you know, the action of a, a matador getting knocked down. Um, he trained for weeks with a semi-pro LA team to prepare for reenacting this drill as a, an artistic performance. And then it's semi-pro players who are running at him. So he put himself exactly in that same um, situation of risk that a football player who's doing this at a practice would have. Um, but it's recorded on the lawn at the LACMA. So this was, you know, when you, if you see beyond the action on the, the screen, you'll see this crowd of museum goers. They're the ones watching this. Um, and he was interested in, in reenacting the drill to call attention to the drill, but also as personal exploration. So something that he had gone through that had some positive aspects on his life and at a time in his life were reinforcing teamwork and strength and all these you know, factors, the reason why these drills started in the first place, um, the ones that are a little more questionable where they don't necessarily relate directly to uh, improvements in gameplay or performance, but are more to be a show of who's the toughest. Um, so, but he also thought, you know, he liked that question of, well, if I'm doing this as an artist, is it any less risk? Or if it's usually happening to people who don't have an audience for it, it's kind of what goes unseen. Um, so you're welcome to watch the whole video. It looks like it's starting to finish up, so it's going to start from the beginning in just another, another minute here. But yes? Don't you think that part of the appeal of fo football is the fact that it is so dangerous? I, th I think... I mean, that's what, yeah, that's why it caught people's attention early on because it was the thrill of what's going to happen. The, 
the outcome is unknown. And then people watch football to this day too, and and we have that it's that same tension of in a world where everything can you know so many things are set in stone. This sport sports in general continue to be one of the things that can consistently actually surprise people, and I'm sure that risk is a big factor in. Are you talking about the drill specifically or the sport in general? Because I think it appeals general, to both. You know, Friday Night Lights, the guy gets, uh, he ends up uh, uh, paralyzed. I mean, it's, it's yeah. TV, but he ends up para paralyzed. The great player ends up paralyzed in the first episode. Right. And, um, but I also had a question about when the national anthem started. When did that tradition oh, of, me, starting, of playing the national anthem Can I before grab this real quick? So, so like we, it's in the news right now yeah. about uh, uh, Black Lives Matter protest with the national anthem. So um, it, you know, it's interesting to bring that up too because right now we've just opened a show in another one of our galleries in response to the common reading Between the World and Me by Tiny right. C. Coates. Right. And with things happening in the public sphere, it's as often happens in museums, suddenly you realize exhibitions that maybe you saw an overlap in, but not as obvious. Is art reflecting life? Is life reflecting art? So we've found a lot of crossovers and public discussions between things we've put on the wall in the museum. Um, right. When that and specifically. Many, many pro football players mm -hmm. are, are African American. Yes, yes, many, and only about 10% of the administration in the NFL is African American. We have over 60% in of players, and the numbers are almost as high uh, at college levels too. And um, I bring up at this point because we have this exhibition catalog we created for this exhibition knowing that we would not be able to bring every image we would have liked to gather for the traveling show um, but also wanting to document the work that we did have we thought it's so important to have a catalog for a show like this that brings together other scholars and additional images so that's the topic of one of the the writings in this. It's called Patriot Games, Military Displays at Football Games by Robert Gumastad, who's a professor of history at Colorado State University. And so he talks about, um, you know, how stadiums, how they early on were being named after Civil War heroes or after battlegrounds. So as early as the, you know, 1917, I think was when one of them was named, the one that John Stuart Curry depicted um, that we didn't point out as we walked through. Um, so I'm sure he answers that question okay. in this essay, and I don't know off the top of my head. Well, even um, with the women's basketball game, we stand for the, the national anthem. Yeah. Not a long time ago, unless the information is not Let's see. Oh, yeah. I'm, it says, Patri he wrote, patriotic organizations yeah. wanted to inculcate patriotism through <clears throat> repeated observance, like reciting the Pledge of Allegiance or observing Armed Forces Day. They also wanted the national anthem regularly played before sporting events and in 1952 um, provided singers before games. So yeah, you're, you're right, 50s and 60s. It also connects to the um, uh, soldier as gladiator because there, there's, well, there's wars now that they can participate in, but in between yeah. the few uh -huh. years we have in between wars. So it's been interesting with um, when guests have come in, and I've done a few tours for groups who um, from all different backgrounds right now, like the Law School Sport Institute came in for a tour. Um, we had uh, members of different groups come through. And sometimes people walk in, and because they, they're just you know, signed up for a tour. They're coming to the museum. They say, this was not what I was ex expecting. And it's always they were either expecting um, like sports memorabilia or Americana or certain certain expectations of this show and people keep having this really great response it's very happy a happy thing for me to see that they say wow football a lot of artists have depicted football and I, I see how much it crosses. you don't have to be a football fan to understand that the imagery has been an integral part of of American experience and we continue to find examples and reflections on any time you turn on the TV yes I'm interested in uh, how deeply embedded this football institution is in our culture, and it's pretty much a uniquely American phenomenon. Yes. Despite the fact that you say it was born out of experiences that are common to a lot of countries, mm -hmm. so this war and frontier. So does this visual imagery and this problem have anything to do with the fact that this is just American as opposed to other places in the world? No, it's interesting. Um, there's a really great radio lab segment that talks about the history of football. And it's the perfect companion to looking at the images here, too. Um, so you can easily you know, find that by taping Radio Lab football. 
but they talk early on in that segment where they say, future archaeologists, if they are looking at you know, 21st century America and they're excavating and they find these giant football stadiums, they're going to immediately think, you know, what were these Americans worshiping? What was this cult at the time of you know, the early 20th century? Um, so it's, it's been interesting, too, to talk about um, football with people who didn't grow up in the United States or um, of all different backgrounds because there is, I keep hearing, there's no, there's no parallel. And even other sports that have very strong followings and are integrally part of culture of other countries, it's a different development and a different love affair than the uniquely American love affair with football. Love it or hate it, it's, it's so intertwined. Um, what, soccer soccer well, the interesting thing about soccer is that it is so widespread. So countries have amazingly strong relationships and long histories with soccer, but it's such an international sport. Whereas football is so isolated okay. to the United States that it creates its own, its own sort of separate petri dish of things to occur as growing out of this, this football and fandom. Soccer is referred to as football everywhere. Yeah. So yes. recently in translating marketing materials, we had to clarify that American football. Oh, yes, so yes. Spanish language materials have been corrected. Yes. And that happened. We call football in the United States in part because the language that we appropriated from European sports trickled down and they were, um, ex they were calling you know, rugby football and association football. Association football being more similar to what we, we call soccer. And sort of as we developed American football out of these traditions of two different games, it stripped away sort of the, the language of association football and um, football was already being called football because it had developed from rugby. And it's, linguistics and all that development is really interesting, too. So, really yeah, thank yeah. you all for your attention. Thank I, you, you so know, much. Thank <laughs> you so much. I'll certainly stay around longer for one-on-one -on -one conversations or to talk about some of the objects that we had to walk past. But um, please, if you're interested in any of these topics, come to, we have three lectures on different topics related to this, including the concussion crisis and how it's been depicted in visual imagery um, by Ma Michael Oriard, who's the expert on that topic. He's had six books on the, the topic of football illustration and is a former football player and the Dean Emeritus at um, Oregon State University. So he had play, played pro football and then left to do his PhD program in English literature. So uh, he'll be here to speak. Lenny Frickman, our co-curator, will speak. We'll have a lecture in November on, um, called From the Stadium to the Streets on documentary um, and street photography. And we now have our um, catalog or calendar of events available, fresh off the presses, so you can grab one of those too. And we'll have two programs related to the show that are not in the museum. One will be a film screening of a documentary called In Football We Trust about Polynesian student athletes in Utah. And we'll have a Q&A session with Chris Young, who's one of the academic advisors for the football team, and a Polynesian, and a former Ducks player. So he will be responding to this from a place of you know, really understanding the culture that's documented in the film. That will be at the Jaqua Center. And um, we'll also have a panel about the use of Native American, the misappropriation of Native American mascots and names in sports um, at the Longhouse with um, guest speakers and advocates. So um, grab the calendar if you're interested. We hope to see you there.